Has the, uh, has the fun started yet? Yeah, yeah, good. How many people in the crowd have actually been to the Reagan Ranch? Raise your hand. All right. If you haven't been, you must go. And uh, by the way, my favorite story about Ronald Reagan is about when he was governor of California and when he was on a college campus. Uh, Ronald Reagan was governor of California, of course, in the 1960s, a very tumultuous time. Uh, and the story is that he went to the University of California at Berkeley uh, to attend a meeting uh, at the Board of Regents. And with him there was his longtime aide, Lynn Nofziger. And they got to the Board of Regents meeting, and the word spread that the Republican governor of California was on campus. So the student radicals started, you know, surrounding the building he was in. And the crowd started to gather, and the meeting was breaking up, and, and outside the crowd started chanting, make love, not war. Make love, not war. And they broke up the, the meeting, and Reagan started to head to the limousine, and Lynn Nofziger said, yeah, you know, the crowd's getting a little bit uh, wild out there. And, and Reagan said, you know, Lynn, let's, let's just keep going. And the crowd keeps chanting, make love, not war, make love, not war. And Lynn Nofziger's getting a little bit more nervous, and they... You know, there's a, there's a hint of uh, marijuana in the air, and they keep chanting, make love, not war, make love, not war. And Nofziger said, well, you know, uh, Governor, maybe we ought to go through the other entrance. And at this point, you know, Reagan's getting irritated, and the crowd keeps chanting, make love, not war, make love, not war. And Nofziger said, maybe we ought to go somewhere else. At which point Reagan turned to him and said, Lynn, I'm not worried. They don't look like they're capable of doing either one. What I'd like to talk to you tonight about, thank you. What I'd like to, like to talk to you tonight about is about the progressive elite in America, particularly those that uh, want to become president of the United States or want to determine the future course of the country. Uh, they get a lot of media attention, they get a lot of uh, rave reviews on college campuses, but I'm gonna encourage you today to follow the money and to think about them in a new way. Not to think of them as political figures with revolutionary ideas. I want, to think of, I want you to think of them as grifters and of people that are not of serious notes, that are cynical, that are hypocritical, and don't often really believe what they actually say. Uh, there are some good political figures in Washington, D.C., but I think a lot of them fit the profile uh, as the way that Mark Twain once explained it when he said that a lot of politicians are like diapers. They need to be changed often for the same reason. So let's begin by looking at some of these people that you hear about on college campus all the time, that you see on national television, are espousing these wonderful progressive ideas. Let's begin with Bernie Sanders. Anybody in the crowd have a friend who loves Bernie Sanders? Exactly. Love Bernie Sanders. And what you hear about Bernie Sanders all the time is Bernie Sanders is genuine. And Bernie Sanders is all about the cause, he's about the little guy, and he's the true believer. And that's what people say they love about Bernie Sanders. Well, let's just walk through Bernie Sanders' career. And you can sort of decide for yourself, beginning with his career before he became mayor of Burlington, Vermont, in 1980. Up until that point, Bernie Sanders, by his own admission, never really held a regular job. Now, why did he never really hold a regular job? Well, his friends that were with him at the time said that he considered those jobs moron jobs. They were jobs that were beneath him. It was not something he felt that he had to do and, and should be required to do. And of course, what this meant is that oftentimes Bernie Sanders ran out of money. So how did Bernie Sanders cope? Well, one of the ways he coped, according to his friends, by the way, these are from his friends, not from his enemies. One of the ways he coped is when the utility was shut off on his apartment in Burlington, Vermont. What did he do? There was a sweet old lady that lived below him that was deaf, she was old, she lived alone. What did Bernie Sanders do? He ran the extension cord down from his apartment through the window and tapped into her electric grid. That's what Bernie Sanders did. When Bernie Sanders did anything in the 1970s, it was run for the U.S. Senate as member of a small minority party called the Liberty Union Party. 
Now, again, running for office um, requires money. What did Bernie Sanders do? Bernie Sanders ran for the U.S. Senate and collected unemployment insurance at the same time. Now, Bernie's big break came when he was elected mayor of Burlington, Vermont, uh, with about 300 vote majority. Had he not won the Burlington mayor race, we probably never would have heard of Bernie Sanders again. But this transformed Bernie Sanders' life in a couple of ways. First of all, it gave him power for the first time. What did Bernie Sanders do with the power that he had? Well, one of the first acts that he took as mayor of this town in, in Vermont was he hired his then girlfriend, later wife Jane Sanders, and put her on the city payroll. The city council said, wait a minute, you can't do that. There's no job that she's actually filling. You can't just start handing out money to, to your girlfriend. Bernie Sanders ignored them, and she stayed on the payroll. When Bernie Sanders moved to Congress, and was elected to Congress in the early 1990s, he learned one of the great secrets of how to legitimately, although corruptly, channel money to your family from your political campaign without even knowing. It's called media buying. Now, a lot of you are familiar with the fact that political campaigns buy television ads and they buy radio ads. And they spend a lot of money doing this. What, what a lot of people don't realize is that the way the business works, if you hire a media buyer, a media buyer can and often will take a commission on that. So if I were running for the U.S. Senate and I hired you as my media buyer and I send, said spend a million dollars on radio or television ads, you would take anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of that, 100,000 or 150,000 of that, and that would be your money. And the beauty of this arrangement is it's not actually disclosed who gets the commission for the media buy. Do you follow? Now, Bernie Sanders runs for Congress, starts doing media buys. Who does Bernie Sanders put in charge of his media buying? His wife. And his wife has no background in media buying. She has never done media buying before in her life. But this is an opportunity for him to channel hundreds of thousands of dollars to his wife through his campaign funds. This becomes a massive amount of money when he runs for president in 2016 because for the 2016 campaign, he spends an astonishing $83 million in media buys. $83 million. The commission on that is, what, $12 million. Now, who got that money? We don't actually quite know, but there are a few clues. Here's what we know. We know that that $83 million was channeled through a company called Old Town Media that had no website, that had no other clients, and the business was literally registered and operated out of a home on a cul-de-sac in suburban Virginia. And when you look at who owns Old Town Media, you find out that it's two friends of Jane Sanders who were doing media buys with her back when Bernie was running for Congress. Now, a progressive reporter actually asked Jane Sanders about this, about Old Town Media, about who was doing the media buys, was she involved, what did Jane Sanders do? She hung up the phone. Look at the wealth that Bernie Sanders has today. A lot of it comes from book writing. One of the few ways left, really the only way left, a U.S. Senator can earn extra income is by writing books. They can't give paid speeches. They can't do consulting work. It's one of the few ways they can actually make extra money. So what does Bernie Sanders do? He writes a lot of books. Nothing wrong with that. I write books. But here's the difference. What does Bernie Sanders do? Bernie Sanders actually has his own political campaigns buy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of his own books. You see how this works? And when you look at the work that Bernie Sanders has done in the U.S. Senate and the House from 1990 up until the present, you realize he's, he's written more books in the last five years than he's actually passed legislation since 1990. He's passed three pieces of legislation. One was a centennial celebration for Vermont. The other one was to name a post office. And the third one was some obscure agricultural bill. But do you see what's going on here? 
Bernie Sanders today, a self-professed socialist, owns three homes. He's worth millions of dollars. And if you look at his rhetoric, it's interesting to see how it's changed. Beginning in the 1970s, up until 2016, Bernie Sanders had a very uh, typical phrase that he always used, and I wish I could do a Bernie Sanders impersonation, but sadly I can't. But what he would rail against is the fact that our politics is dominated by billionaires and millionaires. And he said that beginning in 1975 up until 2016. What happened in 2016? He dropped the millionaire part because he became one. So you see how this works? The point is, is that Bernie Sanders is interested in building wealth for himself and for his family, and much of what he is doing politically is really a political racket. Now let's talk about another uh, uh, progressive out there, Elizabeth Warren. Raise of hands, who has friends that are big fans of Elizabeth Warren? She's the great reformer. She's going to fight corporate America. She's going to fight corruption. Very, very interesting. Elizabeth Warren is actually worth a lot more than Bernie Sanders, which is curious because before she ran for the U.S. Senate, she was a law professor. Now, law professors are paid pretty well, but her net worth is somewhere around $12 million. You don't get $12 million by teaching law, even if you're teaching it at Harvard University. So where does her wealth come from? Well, it's really quite interesting when you look into it. You see, in addition to being a law professor, Elizabeth Warren advised Congress in the mid-1990s on rewriting bankruptcy law. Look, this is very boring. I understand it. Bankruptcy law is not exciting. But it's very important to recognize how this works. Because Elizabeth Warren carried out one of the dirtiest tricks in Washington, D.C., and it helped make her very wealthy. You see, in 1994, she was paid by taxpayers, hired by Congress, to rewrite portions of the bankruptcy law. And what did she do while she was still being paid by taxpayers? She went to large corporations and said, hire me and I will help you navigate the law that I just wrote. Isn't that a great arrangement? So she started doing legal work for Dow Chemical, for Armstrong Worldwide, a whole host of corporations, corporations today, by the way, that she attacks and she criticizes uh, for being corrupt and being greedy. But she charged the equivalent today of $1,000 an hour advising them how to circumvent bankruptcy laws that she had helped to write. That's a pretty good gig, isn't it? Now, let's take this to the second level, the second level of corruption, and that involves her family. Elizabeth Warren has a daughter that set up a, a entity, a company called BTG in 2007 and 2008. And she was trying to raise capital. She was kind of having a hard time doing it. She's trying to raise capital and find partners to help her build this business. That's great. I believe in entrepreneurship. I think you do too. But here's very interesting what happened. In 2008, Elizabeth Warren is asked by then Senator Harry Reid to become the chairperson of something called the TARP Oversight Committee. Anybody remember what TARP is? The Troubled Asset Relief Program. Very boring. Uh, the acronym is kind of silly. But this is the, the organization or the entity which bailed out Wall Street firms in 2008. That's what you need to know. This entity where she was the oversight uh, chair of this oversight committee helped organize and manage the bailout of major Wall Street firms during the 2008 financial crisis. Interesting story. Who did she take to the meeting with Harry Reid when that deal was done? She took her daughter, Amelia, who was trying to raise the capital and find partners for her new business. Who did Amelia end up getting capital and partnerships with for her new business? The very financial institutions that her mother was assisting in the federal bailout. Kind of curious how that works out, isn't it? So you see what's going on here. Both of these individuals are progressive reformers. They attack others, saying that they're greedy, saying that they're corrupt, uh, saying that they have the wrong values uh, because they either aspire to wealth or they work for corporations. But in fact, what these two great reformers are doing is getting rich off of their own activism. 
and they are milking the system in a way that a lot of other people would be hesitant to do and would not do at all. Let's talk finally about uh, another individual who, uh, again, is out there. He's having a little bit of trouble right now, but Joe Biden. Anybody know Joe Biden fans out there? All right, yeah, there, there's a few. Not quite as many as Bernie and, and Elizabeth Warren. He's not quite as popular on campus. But Joe Biden, to my mind, sets the record for the scale and scope of corruption in Washington, D.C. And look, I've been doing this for a long time. I've investigated Republicans. I've investigated Democrats. Uh, there are a lot of bad things that go in Washington, D.C. It's hard to find somebody that has been more corrupt than Joe Biden in both the scale and the scope of what he's done. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, think about it this way. You've heard of the Jackson Five. I'm going to talk about the Biden Five. Now, <laughs> they don't sing as well as the Jackson Five, and I don't think Joe has the moves that Michael had. Um, but the corruption efforts are quite extraordinary. And keep in mind that Joe Biden has been in the Senate since 1972, and then, of course, became Vice President of the United States. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm working on a cold here. Um, so the Biden Five, who are they? It's his son, Hunter Biden. You've all heard about Hunter Biden, right? Uh, you've got his brother, James. You've got his brother, Frank. You've got his uh, daughter, Ashley. And you've got his sister, Valerie. All of them have profited in corrupt ways through government service. So let's begin with Hunter Biden. You all probably have heard and know the story about Burisma and Ukraine and the fact that Hunter Biden was given a gig in Ukraine that paid him a million dollars a year for a job he had no qualifications for and no background in the energy sector and no background in Ukraine. But what you really need to know is this is not just a story of him getting favorable treatment because his name is Biden. There's a timing here that's absolutely key in so many of the stories about the Bidens. So think about this for a second. February of 2014, Vladimir Putin moves into Crimea in Ukraine, setting off the entire crisis that we have there now. A month later in March, Barack Obama, President of the United States, says, Joe Biden, the Vice President, you are going to be the point person on U.S. policy towards Ukraine. All aid dollars are going to flow through you. You are going to have the final say on Ukraine policy. That's in March of 2014. Two weeks after he's appointed is when Hunter gets his gig. Two weeks. Now, do you believe that's a coincidence? I certainly don't think it is. And it fits the pattern of what you see again and again with the Bidens, which is they're cashing in to the access of what Joe Biden does. Consider another example of what Hunter Biden engaged in. And that's in December of 2013, he flies with his father on Air Force Two to Beijing, China. Joe Biden meets with communist officials for three days. He actually gets criticized by the Washington Post for being soft on the Chinese. We don't really know what Hunter was doing there because he was not part of the public agenda. But 10 days after they come back, Hunter's little small financial firm secures a $1 billion private equity deal with the Chinese government. Not with a Chinese bank, not with an American bank in China, with the Chinese government. And to tell you how bizarre this is, according to the Chinese themselves, no other financial institution in China had this deal. Not Goldman Sachs, not JP Morgan, not Deutsche Bank, not Morgan Stanley. The only institution that had it is this small financial firm run by the vice president's son, who, by the way, has no background in China, just like he had no background in Ukraine and has no background in private equity. Let me talk a little bit about Joe Biden's brother, James, to just give you another taste for how this works. In November of 2010, a longtime friend of the Bidens named Kevin Justice goes to the White House and has meetings in Joe Biden's office. We don't know what was discussed, but we know the meeting took place based on White House visitors' logs. Three weeks after that meeting, this new construction company started by this friend, it's called Hillstone International, announces that Joe Biden's brother, James Biden, is the new executive vice president. 
Now, this must be a family habit because just like Hunter had no experience in Ukraine and no experience in China, James has no background in construction. James has no background doing large project construction. But he's now the executive vice president of this newly minted construction company. What happens six months later? This firm lands a $1.5 billion contract funded by taxpayers to build 100,000 homes in Iraq. And there are other contracts to follow. Do you see how this works? Do you see how this happens? Now, a lot of times the reaction that I get from people when it comes to these things are twofold. Some people say, well, yeah, that goes on all the time. I'm not surprised. And what I would say is, no, it does not go on all the time, and it should not go on all the time, and it should not be acceptable. But the second reaction I often get is, well, you know, what can be done about it? And I'm going to explain to you why I think this is so crucial for the battle of the ideas that you are having on your college campuses. Because this is about more than Hunter Biden or Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders or Jane Sanders. This is about the entire essence of why we are conservatives. There's an old saying, uh, originally people believe it might have been Jefferson that said it, certainly Ronald Reagan picked it up, and he said, the extent to which government can do something for you it can do something for you. I'm sorry, to the extent government can do something for you, it can do something to you. I would add to that, to the extent that government can do something for you or to you, it can help make a politician rich. Meaning, the size of government is all about corruption. The bigger government gets, the more corrupt it is going to become. And this is what human history teaches us, right? This is why we are told absolute power corrupts absolutely. They are inherently linked. So the problem you have today with progressives on college campuses, they fail to recognize this. They talk about corruption. Bernie Sanders talks about corruption all the time. Elizabeth Warren talks about corruption all the time. But they have no solution for it because the inherent problem with corruption is the power, the size, and the scope of government. And the only way you can deal with corruption is by limiting its power. Now, step back for a minute and look at the, the scope of political opinion in America today. It's very divided. It's, we're at a very, very divisive time. Progressives, and you see them all the time on college campus, are completely and totally unique. They're different from conservatives, from moderates, from classical liberals, from libertarians, because they are telling us that they are going to fix our problems, which, of course, I completely doubt, but that they're going to fix our problems, but the only way they can fix our problems is by us giving them a lot more power. They don't have enough power right now. They need a lot more. They need to control the health care system entirely. They need to control a larger parts of the economy. They need to take more of your taxes. They are unique in saying that you need to trust us with more power, to which I say, look at the manner in which they've conducted themselves with the little power that they've already had. It's not a pretty picture. We shouldn't trust them with more power, and we need to call them out. Corruption is one of those corrosive things that destroys societies. If you look around the world, the problems in places like Venezuela are not simply the fact that they are socialist systems. It's that they are socialist systems that inherently breed corruption and destroy the very fiber of society. And that is what we are fighting for today. Thank you very much. I would love to take questions or comments that people might have. Are there some microphones? Yes, I think there's a microphone over there. There's a microphone. I think the rule is you're supposed to identify your name and the college you're from, and then uh, please shoot away. Let's start over here. Yes. Hello, my name is Tan Twardowski. I'm from the California State University of Long Beach. Hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to use some of the points you made today to try and convince my friends to change their minds on who they're voting for but I would like to know where you get your information from, like who are your sources, so that way they can also believe what I say. Yeah, it's all, everything is in the book is footnoted. There's about 1,200 footnotes. 
um, and nothing stated as an opinion. There's no interviews. It's all based on doc documents. So the Bernie Sanders material is all based on tax records, uh, financial records. Um, you know, there's some newspaper accounts from when he was mayor of Burlington, but it's all documented. Um, and, and if they say, well, I don't believe you, say, well, look, here, here is the sourcing for it, uh, challenging it. And, and look, Bernie Sanders doesn't really challenge this stuff. He's never really asked about it. When he's asked about it, he does not want to talk about it. What was the name of the book? Uh, it's called Profiles in Corruption. I think you're all going to get copies here at the end. Okay. The Bernie Sanders chapters, thank you. The, uh, the Bernie Sanders chapter is probably 50 pages long, um, so it's going to have all that information in it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Grant Stiles. I go to University of Illinois at Chicago. Hey. First, I wanted to say I love Milton Friedman. I love that he had an influence on your work. Love Milton Friedman. Yes. Um, so my question is about democratic socialism. I wanted to know, like, the same way that the Tea Party slowly faded out, which I think is a bad thing. I love the Tea Party. But... Um, do you think democratic socialism will die a slow death the same way that that happened with the Tea Party, or is it going to be an ideology that's here to stay, even though it's a contradictory, false ideology? I think uh, democratic socialism, unfortunately, is here to stay because they have an infrastructure the Tea Party never had, which is America's college campuses. I mean, you've got you've got universities that that you know the faculty. Uh, is dominated by people who are democratic socialists. So there's an infrastructure there that can incubate and, and expand these ideas. Um, and they're taking power. And if you look in the Democratic Party right now, um, you know, everybody has essentially, with slight variation, adopted Bernie Sanders' position from 2016 which people thought was so radical. I mean, here's this socialist, but, you know, honestly, I mean, Joe Biden is essentially, he's the perceived as the moderate in the race. Uh, Joe Biden's position is, well, I wouldn't take it quite as far as Bernie, uh, but pretty close. So I think democratic socialism is here to stay. And the problem is um, the left is very clever about the way that they debate. And I, I mean clever with a, with a level of respect, but also with a, le a level of disdain. Because cleverness often to me is, is sort of a cynical way of trying to cover up weaknesses. And the weaknesses the democratic socialists have is they refuse to defend any sort of current system today. So you're supposed to defend, uh, you know, an imperfect American economic system and, you know, the challenges that it faces, but they will not defend any system around the world um, you know, whether it's Venezuela or whether it's other failed socialist states. They will sometimes bring out Scandinavia, uh, but they're wrong on Scandinavia. Scandinavia, actually, I mean, I can say this with authority. My mother's Swedish. I know very well the history of Sweden. Sweden was a democratic socialist society until the 1970s uh, when they were on the brink of basically economic ruin. And beginning in the 1980s up to the present time, they have consistently moved in a very strong free market direction. The corporate income taxes in Sweden are much lower than they are in the United States. So what I would say is I would challenge people when you're arguing with democratic socialists, say, I'm not going to have a conversation about me defending the real world and you pre presenting some abstract Bernie Sanders idea mm -hmm. that doesn't exist any in the world. It's a stupid to have that kind of conversation. You need to compare real world versus real world. That's what I would say. Thank you. Sure. Yes, over here. Hello, my name is Jordan Clements. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. Hook them, y'all. Um, so something I was wondering is, in your speech you mentioned also looking into corruption within the Republican Party. What yeah. I'm wondering is, have you noticed a pattern of corruption in the Republican Party being like, are the, are the more corrupt members like the more rhinos and moderates, like, while well, not being like true principal conservatives, or they're like not really a pattern there? Great question. Um, you know, the, the, the one common denominator seems to be the longer somebody stays in Washington, D.C., the more, uh, let's say, they become tempted by these things. Um, I worked on a book um, years ago with one of my favorite political figures, which is Bobby Jindal, the former Louisiana governor. Um, and, and Jindal told this story. He served, I think, three terms in Congress. Uh, and, and he was very candid with me. He said, you know, when, when you first get up there, there are all these things going on, and you're thinking, oh, these just seem kind of, you know, dirty. I mean, this is like a cesspool. 
you feel like it's just a, you don't like some of the things you're seeing and some of the deals that are being made and how you know lobbyists are doing this and doing that. He said, but you stay there for a while and that cesspool turns into a hot tub. You start getting comfortable and accepting the fact that, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad. So I think it's the, that corrosive effect of power. It's one of the reasons that I believe uh, it's not perfect, but I believe a, an important reform is term limits. I think term limits are, thank you. You know, we, we are uh, governed by laws, not by men. No person is irreplaceable. If we believe in principles and ideas, Ronald Reagan, you know, was once asked, you know, what it felt like to be such a great man. And Reagan said, well, I'm not a great man. I just believe in great ideas. That to me is a quintessential sort of conservative view that it's the ideas that matter. So no one's irreplaceable. And I do think the longer you stay in office, you get very accustomed to the perks of power, bending rules. So that's the common denominator, probably more than what the ideology happens to be. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hello, my name is Patsy from the University of Mary Washington, Virginia. This is possibly a loaded question, so if you don't want to answer it, that is fine. No, sure. But I was curious what your take is regarding the numerous corruption allegations against President Donald Trump. No, I think it's a great question. Look, I, I talk about this in the first chapter of the book. Um, every political figure needs scrutiny, everyone, because as conservatives, again, we are concerned about governmental power. Um, and I think when, as it relates to, uh, to Trump, um, I think his policies have been great. Um, and I think it's good for him to have scrutiny. I think the challenge is we, ha we live in a time of what I call the Trump vortex. And that is that there is a singular focus on Trump in terms of journalism, in terms of investigative reporting. Some of it's good, a lot of it's not. Um, but it kind of is like the total, total eclipse of the sun. It blocks out any scrutiny of other figures. So one of the reasons I wrote the book is to say, look, Trump needs continued scrutiny, but we need to not neglect these other people. Um, so what do I think about Trump as it regards to uh, uh, these obstruction issues? I think the obstruction of Congress um, uh, allegation uh, or charge uh, was ridiculous. Uh, Donald Trump was exerting executive privilege the way that other presidents have. Um, these are oftentimes settled by the courts, and the courts will sometimes compel the executive branch or the president to turn over information, and I'm sure Trump would do that. Trump wouldn't defy the courts, uh, and he hasn't done that. So I think the obstruction charge um, uh, was ridiculous. I think the abuse of power charge as it relates to the phone call with Zelensky is also ridiculous because I think the call was actually quite legitimate. And, you know, and here's why. Uh, Donald Trump was talking to a newly elected leader, Zelensky, of Ukraine, which is one of the, if not the, most corrupt countries in the world. A reporter from Reuters said uh, a couple of years ago, there are things that go on in Ukraine that we, would make Nigerians blush. Nigeria is a long time seen as a very corrupt country. So Ukraine is in a terror. Now, Ukraine also receives billions of dollars in Western aid, billions of dollars in U.S. aid. And actually, during the Obama administration, you had this strange situation where we handed over, um, along with the International Monetary Fund, about $1.2 billion to the Ukrainians in guaranteed loans. And it went into this bank called Privat Bank. And the money disappeared. Literally, $1.2 billion completely disappeared. Now, here how, this is how it's related to that phone call, and you don't see this reported anywhere. Um, Zelensky, who was elected, his biggest financial backer is a Ukrainian oligarch named Kolomoisky. You can Google this and find this. Kolomoisky is his backer. The bank where the $1.2 billion disappeared, Privat Bank, is run by Kolomoisky. So for Donald Trump to ask Zelensky to look into corruption and to look into corruption involving the Bidens is entirely appropriate. To say, work with my attorney general, he wasn't saying make up information. He wasn't saying give us dirt. He was saying, whatever information you have, hand it over to our attorney general uh, to look at. Because ultimately, Democrats in Congress are, are right. Nobody is above the law. That also applies to the Bidens. 
it also applies to the Bidens. And, and if you have the transference of funds to the vice president's son just a couple of weeks after he's appointed in charge of Ukrainian policy, and that money is coming from a corrupt energy company that involves people that are supporting the new Ukrainian president, of course you can legitimately raise that issue. So uh, I don't think that, um, that uh, I don't know that I would say it was a perfect call, like, like Trump says, but I say it's completely legitimate. Uh, and I think that the charges in, in both of these cases were, were silly and ridiculous. Thank you. Sure. Over here. Uh, my name's Alex Hopper from University of Memphis. Go Tigers. <laughs> Uh, but my question had to do with uh, how the media relates to corruption in our government today. It seems like, with, like you said, with the Trump vortex and a new shooting to report on almost every other day that issues such as this money spending or more recently our uh, personal liberty of being able to smoke before the age of 21 keep being brushed under the rugs quick with the 24-hour news cycle quicker than we can be outraged to do something about it. So I'm wondering, from your investigations into corruption, how often and how badly did media play effect in that? Uh, it's a great question. I think that, that the consistent and continued failure of the media to perform the function that it's supposed to, uh, that it's supposed to perform is probably the biggest challenge that our country faces right now. Uh, and what do I mean by that? We need a healthy, robust, trustworthy media. Um, well, look at the opinion polls. I mean, their approval ratings are hovering down there with Congress. About 18% of the American people believe the media is doing a good job. Uh, they're not doing a good job. Uh, there, there's bias. Um, there's a lack of commitment to real research and journalism. I mean, I'll be very blunt. I run a research organization in Tallahassee, Florida that does the you know, research on my books. Um, nobody would know about Hunter Biden except for the fact that my researchers uncovered his deals in China and the extent of his deals in Ukraine. Were not for them, nobody would even know about Hunter Biden because the media certainly didn't report any of it. If you read a newspaper like the Washington Post, you don't know about Hunter Biden's deal with China because the Washington Post has never reported on it. I would dare say if it was Donald Trump Jr. who'd flown on Air Force One with his dad to China and had come back with, let's say, a billion dollar energy deal, he has no background in energy, I think the Washington Post would be all over it. I would be all over it. But the failure of the media is sowing more distrust in America's institutions today than really any other institution. And I don't really see it changing anytime soon. I wish I'm an optimist, but I don't see it changing anytime soon. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Hi, my name's June White. I'm from Pinecrest High School. Hi. Um, my question's a little bit similar to the person who went before me, but you described a lot of corruption within progressive families. Um, I was wondering if you found similar uh, corruption within the Trump administration with all of the family ties. Good question. Um, yeah, I'm, first of all, um, I'm not a big fan uh, of um, family members working in positions, so I don't think I don't think it's a good idea. I don't th I don't think it's a good idea um, for you know Ivanka and Jared to be working in the White House. I just don't. Um, there's a slight benefit to it in that uh, they, uh, by working in government, they do actually have to disclose their finances. They would not have to do that if they weren't in the White House. But I don't think that's a good idea. Um, when uh, Trump was elected in January of 2017, I actually co-wrote a piece in the Washington Post uh, with a guy named Norm Eisen, who was Barack Obama's uh, ethics czar. Um, and we laid out six things that we felt Trump had to do uh, to make sure that there wasn't corruption involving his businesses uh, and his family. And if you go back and read the piece, um, I think they've actually done a, a, a good job of living up to those. Um, you know, the fear was they were going to start doing, you know, major hotel projects in all these countries overseas, Saudi Arabia, China, and that these foreign governments were going to approve those deals to curry favor with, with Trump. Um, none of that's happened. They swore off those deals. So there's been a lot of good work that's been done there. I talk a little bit about the Trump, some of the, the concerns. The Chinese, I think, are definitely trying to cultivate a relationship with the Trump kids. 
uh, because they want to uh, get Donald Trump to weaken his stance on China. Um, but uh, the family has not taken those deals, and my hope is that, we'll, that they will continue to not take those deals. Uh, so to answer your question, there are things that I don't like. Again, I do not like family members working in the White House. Uh, but as it relates to the commercial side of it, um, they've actually done a pretty good job. I mean, the, the nightmare scenario, they were going to be, you know, constructing all these projects around the world, has not happened. They have taken the position they're not going to do that, and I think they need to be commended for that. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Alex Siller. I'm from the University of Virginia. My question is kind of like direct. Um, I want to know why does the message that is propagated by the Democratic Party that we are being oppressed by the upper class, the 1%, why does that message resonate so well with like, not just the public, but just like the Democratic Party? You see that like, historically there are trends in time where you have major dictators that literally have that same exact message. I won't name any, but you can think of the worst and they have the same message. Um, why is that so powerful now, more than ever? Is that a Bernie thing? Is that just something that comes, it's going to happen cyclically? And It's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of factors. One, there is a certain cyclical nature to it. Um, you've seen parts in, in times in American history, the early 20th century, Eugene Debs and others who, who uh, uh, you know, ran for president. You had other political figures who ran for president. Actually got a somewhat sizable percentage of the vote, uh, and then would it, it would wane. But I think today... Today, the reason, a lot of it has to do with this infrastructure that I'm talking about. I mean, you have uh, people on college campuses um, who are being paid well as college professors. A lot of them, frankly, aren't teaching that many courses. They got a lot of time on their hands. Um, and they're embracing these sort of utopian ideas. And, and part of it, frankly, is envy. Uh, part of it is, is a, 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 a bitterness. Uh, there are a lot of academics. I have friends that are professors that are wonderful academics as well. But there are a lot of academics, honestly, who got their PhD, uh, put in all this time and effort, spent all this money on their degree, were told by uh, their professors and by their sponsors how smart they were, how they were going to set the world on fire. And 20 years later, you know, they're teaching some 101 classes, and they feel like um, they're not appreciated. And they feel like they're smarter than the guy down the street who's running, you know, maybe a, a, a car shop and making six times what they're making. So part of it, I think, is a resentment and bitterness that's fueled. So it, it's kind of like Bernie's idea. There are moron jobs. Um, the sense that the certain types of work are beneath them um, and that they should be uh, more recognized and compensated for what they're doing. And if that's not going to happen, if I can't earn more, I want to tear down the other guy um, uh, to, to create a greater equality. So I think a lot of it is, is actually that. There's a visceral nature to it. And what you find is, as with Bernie and, and, and the others, is they do all have, or a lot of them have, this yearning for income, uh, uh, for wealth, but they just mask it. They just mask it. You see this in Hollywood all the time. I mean, think about all these people in the Hollywood left who are railing against the greedy rich. Do they really tell their agent to go to the movie studio and, oh, just give, just, you know, take whatever they'll offer? No. They're fighting for every cent. Um, they just mask it. So I think that's part of what we're seeing. Is it's this infrastructure uh, that's trying to convince people this is the wave of the future. That's what I think is behind a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the income inequality debate that, that's taking place today. Thank you so much. Sure. Yes, over here. Hello, my name is Savannah Hi. Robertson. Uh, Hi. I'm from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. And uh, my question goes back to fake news and the media bias. Uh, I was just uh, wondering your take on how policymakers should, on left and both right wings, uh, address that problem. It's a great question. I don't know that there's a lot policymakers can do. Um, I do think that, um, uh, honestly, it's, it's very healthy um, you know, when, when, when President Trump, um, you know, simply says, I'm not going to answer questions from certain reporters, uh, especially the reporters that are baiting him, that are trying to get, you know, their, their attention on the camera or uh, that are trying to score points with their friends. 
I think, I think it's good to just sort of dismiss, uh, to dismiss those people. It's very different than it was 30 years ago where there were a lot of political figures who were so concerned about what the Washington Post or the New York Times would write about them. Honestly, those papers have become far less relevant than they were 30 years ago. So I think the best thing they can do is not change policy, but just simply ad adopt the attitude of, of, of not taking a lot of journalists as seriously as they think they should be taken. Um, and, and that's probably, it's, it's more of an attitude thing, I think, that could be done. The other thing I would say that can be done is, uh, you know, I hate to quote Mao, because Mao was a mass butcher, but when he said, you know, let a thousand uh, uh, blooms blossom, um, that's what we need in media. I mean, we need people that are, are you know, blogging, uh, that are doing reporting on their campuses, um, doing things with video podcasts, because so much, especially your generation, is getting their news and their information from those kinds of media outlets. And I think that's a healthy thing. I think it's a healthy thing to have that kind of competition. The branded media is losing control of the audience and it's losing control of its voice because people distrust it. Um, and honestly, I think that's a healthy development. Thank you. Sure. Hey, I'm Grant Freiling from Fresno Valley Christian School in Marshall, Virginia. Uh, Milton Friedman once stated that he believes that one of the main factors behind the creation of a, of a monopoly is government intervention within a market or industry. Would you say that some of the examples you, you gave today prove that idea or at least parts of it? Yes, great question. There's, there's, uh, and I think uh, Uncle Milty, as we used to call Milton Friedman, uh, is absolutely correct. A lot of monopolies. There's, there's a, uh, an interesting analogy. It's anybody here from Clemson University? Nobody from Clemson? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, there's a great professor there, Bruce Yandel, uh, who used this analogy to make this point of, of creating uh, monopolies and control, and he called it the Baptist bootlegger alliance, the Baptist bootlegger alliance. And here was the alliance. During Prohibition, and right after Prohibition ended, there was a very strange alliance that fought very hard to turn dry counties that serve no alcohol into wet counties, right, that could serve alcohol. It was art and Baptists who on religious grounds did not want alcohol served, and bootleggers because bootleggers didn't want the competition, right? They wanted to keep selling their product with no competition. Well, you see that in the marketplace all the time. Uh, a lot of the great liberal financial reforms operate this way. There was one that passed under Obama um, in, uh, in uh, 2010, uh, which was um, involving financial uh, regulation. Uh, and it was this massive bill um, and what was the end result of this massive bill? Now, the, the political left said, we need to put all these new regulations on investment banks and financial institutions to make sure that we don't have a financial crisis again. Okay, that's good, that makes sense. But the rules were so large and onerous, what happened? Well, the big financial institutions like Goldman Sachs and J.B. Morgan, they're so big, they could hire 300 people to comply with these rules who couldn't comply with the rules, their mid-sized and smaller competitors, because they couldn't afford to comply with the regulations. Now, here's where it gets interesting. These rules were so complex, the bill, when you add all the rules, was 10,000 pages long. Who wrote that law? Lobbyists paid by the largest financial institutions. Do you see what's happening? They wanted to create regulations. It was going to cost them a little bit of money, but it was going to throw their smaller competitors out of business because they couldn't comply. So Milton Friedman is, is exactly right, and most regulations operate that way. They operate in a manner where they stifle competition, they favor the big guy, and they, they hamstring the middle guy who, who has trouble complying with these rules, and they end up going out of business. One of the biggest myths you hear Bernie say this all the time, you hear Elizabeth Warren, your college professors say it all the time, is the way you fight big business is with government. That is completely wrong, because the dirty secret is big business and big government work hand in hand. It happens all the time. And, and that's how regulations get done, and that's why regulations end up 
reinforcing monopolies rather than breaking them up. Thank you. Sure. And, and I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. You've been a great audience. Thank you.